Um, thanks everybody for dialing in, um, whichever time zone you are. So you can already see our distinguished speaker is here on the line. And before we start, let's just spend maybe two, three minutes introducing to you what our society is, um, in case you're new, hopefully many of you are not. So, you know, just quickly to give credit to everybody who is involved in organizing, of course, um, Jen, he's being the mastermind behind the Martlet Society. He's being, you know, he invited um, Dr. Uke here and he brought everybody together so that this session can happen. And a bit more on the society itself. Um, if you can flip to the next page. Oh, no, actually first, the agenda for today. So um, we're gonna spend, you know, just a few minutes introducing our society and the speaker. And then we'll hand over to him so that he's going to um, share his research um, and translation of his research. And then the last 30 minutes, we will open the floor to the audience and you can interact with Dr. Uke live. Right, so let's start. A little bit about the society. So um, the original idea of the Marlet Society is bringing academics together to communicate research. And by academic, we mean really, you really a wide range of people who are currently doing their PhD, some of the masters, um, or people who have graduated and are doing postdoc or even, you know, um, holding professorship positions somewhere around the world. And we also have um, a couple of people like myself who left academia to pursue other interests, but want to stay close to academia to hear about the latest research and hear about what everyone else is doing. Um, so that brings us to the different branches of our society. We have the TMS talk, which is centered around academic research. In every session, we have someone from a different field telling us about the amazing discoveries they have made, the amazing publications they've um, achieved and you know, the great science. We also have the WVA talk, which is the intersection between science in the real world, either people who went from science into startup or, you know, consulting or um, even, you know, industry or even banking. So this is for you to um, really see that having a degree in having a PhD degree in your discipline does not limit you to doing ac academic research. There is a whole world out there which you can explore. And finally, we also have special issues, for example, the skills workshop where Jen um, gave, shared his experience making ama amazing figures and graphs for papers. And sometimes we also have the special speakers like editor in chief of journals or um, some famous comedians coming to give us a special session about their experience. So that's pretty much about our society and feel free to you know, scan the QR code and log onto our website and follow us. And now let me hand over to Edi to introduce our speaker today. Yeah, great. So very, very honored today to have uh, Dr. Hyun Woo Yuk today. Um, so Dr. Hyun Woo is currently a research scientist at the Department of uh, Mechanical Engineering at MIT. His research focuses on soft materials, for example, hydrogels for uh, bioadhesive, human machine interface, bioelectronics, and 3D printing technologies, etc. And Dr. Yuk completed his bachelor degree at the Korea Advanced Institute of Science and Technology in Dajun, Korea, and moved to Cambridge, Massachusetts for his master's and PhD at MIT uh, with uh, Professor Xuan He Zhao. Dr. Yuk has also been very productive in his research and has published more than 30 articles and as well as like more than uh, 17 pat patents. So he is also a recipient of a very various award, including Forbes 30 under 30 science. So without further ado, let's hand over the mic to, to Yung Wu. Uh, Yung Wu, the stage is all yours. You can show your screen and start today's presentation. All right, good. Thank you so much for uh, this chance. And I'm very glad to uh, have opportunity to share this. So title I put is best side to bench to best side to share my ongoing journey on uh, biodiesel translations. Uh, but uh, as a as a start, uh, I would share more on a, like an inventor and researcher uh, perspective because I'm not a business uh, kind of expert, 
and I'm not a kind of successful CEO at now, or we didn't make a big money, but I want to just share the experience of like how we can do something at a university level from personal motivations and try to push that thing into the beyond the university boundaries to get into the more real world impact, et cetera. So I think it will be more resonating for the people who are thinking similarly, like uh, have some interesting technologies that are developing or developing their hand in laboratory and think about where we can do to make this into more uh, interesting other than to academic papers alone. So given that, I would like to start with um, some basic terms. Uh, the, there are many types of translation or commercialization in that technology areas, but in particular for uh, biomedical technologies such as medical devices that are building man food and drugs, it is commonly called as a bench to bedside process. Bench means in laboratories, universities, and bedside is actually a, a patient uses, et cetera. So these are the basically uh, very commonly used terms, especially around the NIH side. Uh, but uh, today I would like to talk a little more like a different way because I want to call it as like a best side to bench to best side because uh, I personally feel like uh, not only the translation, but as a personal, like individual researcher engineer, what is really interesting part about our life is where the motivation is coming from to what we do. So on top of conventional bench to best side, I would like to share more on a best side to bench side and a little more information about where, how to go to bench to best side based on my personal experiences, that lead to technological development and the willingness or motivation to push it further out of the research laboratories. So to start, I think it's uh, very interesting to myself and you to share my personal bad side experience. So uh, I was a little far away from uh, biomedical stuff because I have been very healthy per person for uh, luckily for my most of the life until I'm in the 20s. But sadly, uh, all the tragedy come as an like, unexpected accident. So my little brother got a very, 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 very tragic accident around nine years ago, around the two years ago before I uh, decided to go out for a uh, grad study for overseas. And resulting in a broken body in many places and a breaking heart for me and my family it was actually horrible. Say, uh, I, like, I'm not a surgeon, I'm not a doctor, but I could see the whole process of hospitalization over two years, starting from emergency room, intensive care unit, several departments in the hospital bed, and eventually the rehabilitation hospital. Gone through a lot of things. Say, on the day of the accident, I see the hemorrhage, like a lot of blood. And uh, four major surgeries, my little brother, go for it, ruptured aorta, so he had to stand and repair it. Broken spine, well, so I have a spine surgery. Collapsed the facial bones, so we have reconstructive surgeries. And crushed ankle and leg bones, we have a tons of orthopedic surgeries. And uh, some readmission surgeries, because he had a too long time of uh, intubation to the trachea, and eventually got scarred and narrowed on, couldn't breathe, so we had to do a trachea surgery. Uh, lie down a pre like a hospital bed for a long time, so develop a pressure ulcer in many places. Very difficult chronic immune to treat. Countless scar tissues, and uh, I don't know, the rehabilitation, you know, when somebody got a broken spine, they need to really rehabilitate hard to, to uh, walk again, but eventually still lost the feeling and right foot was great. And uh, if you have a chance to have this gone through with your family or yourself, Money vaporizes. This money literally vaporizes. We lost so much money uh, in hospitalizations and surgeries. Uh, so this is really a lot to pass through. And uh, I was a kind of a pretty much away from the biomedical stuff, but it really made me think hard. And uh, but the good thing is it can be gone through eventually. So my brother just two days ago graduated from university, uh, overcoming all these difficulties. So it's kind of getting better now, but it's really these core processes, which is really overturned the whole personal life, really made me think like, can I contribute to make a better treatment for devastating clinical challenges like so? Many times we spend a lot of money, but surgeons just say that this is the best they can do, but they don't know whether this is the best. And I see a lot of problems. And these are the something very personal motivations that give us pain. And I believe Considering the high traffic and major hospitals in the world, this is not the only pain or suffering that I suffer, but
but there are tons of millions of people may see the same problems every day. So this really uh, made me think like, this is something that I resonate and can I do something? So I decided to go for a grad study to build my professional career to do something around this. So when I was in the KAIST as undergrad students, I worked on biomimetic robotics and uh, my brother used that to provide a robotically assisted rehabilitation devices to help in water game. So when I got admission to MIT Mechanical Engineering for grad study around seven years ago, I naturally inclined for rehabilitation robotics because I was interested about it. It was a resonating topic. But the, everything is not planned. Uh, life is an unexpected event. So robotics lab and MIT actually had available a position for me or wanted me as a grad student. So um, unexpectedly, I joined the laboratory working on soft motor technologies with a focus on mechanical robust hydrogels and especially around the 3D printing because that's the minor overlap, tiny, tiny overlap I could have as my robotics background with uh, some lab that have a position that I can join. So it was a far away from the ideal beginning, a little frustrating, but it was still interesting to delve into new areas so this is not about a research topic, but I just want to spend a couple of minutes to just introduce what my researches are. So I'm working on hydrogel. I'm a hydrogel guy. And hydrogel is a polymer network infiltrated with a large amount of water. And it's very interesting material if you are a material scientist. And it's, if you are an engineer, it is a uniquely advantageous material for various applications because it shares so much features to our body or biological tissues like wet, soft and elastic and biocompatible functional and it's like ion-based electrical transmissions, which is not a surprising because our body or food are all made out of protein-based hydrogels and it's just a naturally it is very interesting material. But I want I don't want to go back deep too much about it because it's uh, my personal research. You can always ask or look, look up my papers for it. And uh, among the more specificity of this research topic, I am addition, I am addition guy. So in my early research really focused on a tough wet addition of these materials. And there are a really interesting story how I started to work on this addition, but I may not cover it today because it's kind of a long story. But uh, in a nutshell, uh, among various hydrogel technologies, I focused on addition, especially uh, robust addition of this particular wet material. So we did some uh, interesting early contribution to this field now become a pretty uh, vibrant and uh, grow, like, rapidly growing field of so-called hydrogel solid hybrids and their applications. So it was uh, basically consumed my first year in my MIT, it was an interesting topic. And uh, you can see the sticky materials that here very strongly on the software. So it's basically, this is my research expertise and background on hydrogel. And among many hydrogels, I'm very good at making it sticks very well. So I thought that was my uh, research background. And uh, well, as a typical academic research, um, once I have some papers that people like it, and I have to follow up with many, many things, uh, pretty diverse areas with a pretty uh, productivity, like lots of papers, uh, but I really didn't do what much of a translation focus. So therefore I actually had a, this period was very productive. This, this is just part of the papers I published at the moment for two to three years. But I would say it was with identity crisis because my initial motivation on biomedical impact, it's been absolutely being faded. And uh, I even tried to do some medical device coatings kind of thing, but it's still kind of a quite far away from my personal motivation because it's nothing but uh, making uh, artificial overlap with uh, some chem chemical topics to write a paper. So it was a productive period initially, first few years, but it was identity crisis because I feel like I'm getting more and more away from my original intention to being a professional on these research areas. But a uh, turning point comes very uh, interesting. There was an expected translation of a hydrogen vision, which I didn't never ever personally try. So to my surprise, in 2017, uh, technological licensing office of MIT just to tell us like, oh, what patent you guys filed in MIT, which is about a hydrogen elastic hybrid. It's actually licensed to a company uh, and they actually adopted in the manufacturing of their product, which is ultrasound phantom for clinical expert training for ultrasound imaging, imaging or elastography or sonography. And uh, it's actually been commercially distributed across the United States and people are using it in hospital training. Uh, and uh, it's even generating very tiny, it's very tiny, 
But Ely royalties as well from 2017 to continuously. So the company paid for the patent cost of the occurred and a paying a royalty. Uh, so this was completely unexpected because uh, we as inventors didn't try to do this. They just suddenly, the company found the technology and they license it. And we just later know it and like, oh, you guys use it. But it really gives a completely different type of level of satisfaction compared to the paper publications. And it's really served as a um, turning point. This unexpected translation really made me look back into my personal motivation on contributing to make better treatment for clinical challenges instead of uh, writing more papers. So then after this thing happened around 2017, 2018, something this period, I thought it was moment of reckoning. So I decided to restart from my personal motivation. Yet I can still take advantage of my technical expertise. I'm hybrid guy, I'm an Asian guy. But I have a set of questions I ask at the moment. First question is, what should I do differently if my focus is to make real world impact problems I, for the problems I can, not a fancy focus? My technical expertise is soft material, hydrogels, additions. Can this provide opportunity for a long list of problems I have experienced and willing to solve? And the most tricky question at the moment I have to encounter is I'm not a clinic expert realistically, and I do not understand the med demands. But we do search Google's and try to write a beautiful introduction for papers just to make it important. But I know, and maybe you know, that it's just a you know, paper publication tricks. But realistically, I am not a clinic expert, and I do not understand that. And how can I make sure that I'm relevant to the real world problems and I'm at demand beyond my relatively uh, personalized memories? But these are the questions I had to answer to do things seriously. So uh, the first thing I realized to enter this question is I have to go beyond the Googling and reading papers. Because real world is out of computer screen and it's Googling the papers or reading other people's introduction in papers doesn't help at all. It doesn't help at all because it does not have any endorsement from the people who actually do that thing. It's just imagination basically. So in my case, I had some luck that I helped me tremendously on this process of overcoming processes. The first thing is uh, when I think really hard about these problems or questions, I saw an advertisement on NSF ICO program in MIT. The ICO program is a cost, basic a customer discovery program supporting the federal agency, NSF, NIA, whatever. And uh, it's really the program that keep asking you to get out of your laboratory offices and meet the end users and talk with them, learn their real demands, and align your technological development with end users' opinions and eventual uh, some, some actual demand that out there. And I immediately registered and completed it. It was tremendously helpful. The second lug I had is somehow I got a connection with a tremendous clinical collaborator, uh, uh, Dr. Christoph Knapp. At the moment, he was an MGH, so he's a local first person, but I can go there and meet him. But later, he moved to Mayo Clinic in Rochester. But I had a luxury that we had some kind of mild collaborative relationship with this uh, wonderful clinicians that I can, hear from, I can hear from his opinion and also get a help to reach out other clinical and biomedical end users, which who are the colleagues of him in the greater Boston areas and in the Mayo Clinic, et cetera. So these are the kind of uh, timely lots that I had that I can utilize and I utilized very well. So with these processes, I learned that I'm hydrogels and I'm a addition guy and I like bioadhesive area, which is already a kind of a sizable domain in these biomedical devices. So this looks like something that I may contribute because it's resonating with my background. So I wanted to learn more. And uh, I looked at a more fundamental problem of this device uh, aims, surgical sealing and repair, which is a uh, challenge in surgery because of failure or uh, suboptimal addressal of a surgical sealing is a big problem. And I have seen personally what's how deadly or how bad they are. And uh, I could see uh, some examples here, are some examples, for example, bleeding, the hemorrhage this is really common and it's very costly, which I personally know because we paid a lot for blood during each surgery. And it's life threatening because the first and second cause of death in military and civilian sector. And I know it because my brother almost died because too much bleeding. And the second thing is a leaks on a surgeries. I, uh, the gastrointestinal leak is very representative cases, which is very deadly, but 
there are other types of leaks, so like air leaks and all different kinds of leaks you can imagine. So these are very deadly problems, and it's still not yet optimally solved yet, which my experience also is telling as well. But the important thing is that these are really strongly resonating with my personal experience and frustration, so I'm really excited about this. Because it really reminds me of old saying by Plot that our need will be our real, that will be the real creator. Or this sentence being more like being mixed up into English language of the necessity, the mode of invention, etc. So this was really an exciting way that I look into the problem and I think about what I'm doing as a researcher. So I excited because this was resonating with my personal experience and frustration and my willingness to solve something. And I take a look deeper with help of all those uh, opportunities things that I actually look at. So there are standard care, which was sutures, like three, over 3,000 years or technologies. But I just know suture is suture, but I have to ask the clinical expert I can meet and ask, what are the problem of this old technology? Because if old technology is really good enough, there's no point of making new technology. But uh, luckily for me, it is still, uh, it is pretty uh, problematic still because uh, it's a complex procedure, typically requires quite surgical acumen, especially for complex uh, surgeries. It really does need a surgical acumen. Like it requires very experienced hand to be rightly done. It is naturally tissue damaging nature because the hands the needle piercing processes. And because it's a needle piercing processes, it had point by ceiling, stress concentration, and all this kind of a natural mechanic environment, this particular method imposed can cause a lot of a problem such as local adhesions of tissues and leakages, etc. And when I think more, well, people also use a stapler. Uh, was surprised to me because I only use stapler for my uh, papers, but people also use stapler for human body as well. It's so around hundreds of years ago invented by in Germany, and now it's very widely used in gastrointestinal surgeries and uh, uh, minimally invasive thoracic surgeries as well. So it's widely adopted, probably uh, based on surgeons, it's partly because it's faster and more reproducible than sewing, hand sewing processes. But uh, it's still a uh, tissue damaging and it's still point-wise closures and it's still introducing metallic clips to hold the tissues together. So statistically in a clinical literature, it actually doesn't change much of the rate of a surgical rate repair failures compared to sutures. And uh, because it is kind of a metallic clipping and blading processes in principle, there are some safety concerns and FDA actually issued a safety concern letters around March 2019. So these are interesting new developments around 100 years ago, but still a kind of a ongoing uh, problems. So here is the most exciting thing that I could discover. The tissue of this uh, is a so-called super glue in our engineering laboratory, and people actually use it in the human body. Uh, uh, so these are most recent, around 20 years ago, the commercial available. But uh, it's conceptually very favorable. It does not like, in, like damaging the tissue, just gluing on it or sealing on it, like a taping or gluing it. It's conceptually very favorable. Uh, everybody agrees with it. But the problem is existing technologies fail to meet various clinical demand. Where this point is a wow for me, because if it is already perfect, I should give up on this problem. But thankfully, surgeons complain so much on the existing technologies that actually purchase to use my patient. And I could collect a very repeating answers like why they are complaining on existing technologies. So I did uh, interviews and surveys with the 30 plus surgeons in taking good advantage of the Boston's close vicinity to a lot of Harvard Medical School hospitals such as MGH, Brigham, and BIDMC, and also nearby center like the Puck Medical Center, UPMC, and also Mayo Clinic, thanks to Dr. Naptic. So I could hear a lot of opinions and I summarized it into a few repeating things like a complex length of preparation, wet and bleeding, especially actively bleeding tissue compatibility, slow tissue sealing, insufficient sealing. It's basically just uh, more like uh, complaints from end users. And therefore is a met demand, means is opportunity for engineers because if I can solve and if I can make them less complaining, they may uh, love it. So these are the things that I learned during this so-called customer discovery processes. And as a researcher, I could look at the academic literature as well, that whether these are actually being sold at academic level, but not yet become commercial product. But thankfully it was not, at least in my um, level of understanding. So I was excited that I decided around two years ago, okay, this is the problem that I want to dig into deeper. Looks like I can do something on it, but 
here I want to share some personal, uh, like more personal experience of how I did it in terms of development for the last two years. So uh, because I write a quite a paper and I keep writing papers and as a paper oriented research project we typically do, uh, I know and it's fragmented. It's not fragmented in bad way, but it's fragmented intentionally most of the time. The reason is the academic novelty is something that we should care because something different, something novel compared to the earlier development of ourselves or other peoples are treated better in terms of paper publication by editors and reviewers because we are chasing for the fragmentization by overcoming the overlap. But I realized that these are a kind of great way to make a papers, but it's not really ideal for building portfolio of technologies to be the focus and synergy. So therefore it's much better, much better or critically important for translation that having a base technology that being built upon each other so that it really shares the main component. So you don't need to repeat, you have a 10 functionality, you don't need to repeat a 10 different safety tests, 10 different manufacturing optimization, 10 different GMP process uh, figuring out, but well, you can just do a couple and one figuring out a base technology really like, like propagating through the whole portfolio of technology. These are something that industry folks are really love to do. So although I'm not yet in industry, I kind of learned this problem because I know that my previous research is a fragment that because I wanted to write a paper, not a making a portfolio of technology. So I wanted to overcome this when I do this at this time by learning from end users' voices. So these are the kind of small personal steps I take and which summarize what I did for the last few years about this biodiversity technology portfolio we have in our hands. The first step is converting initially identified met demands for end users into technological goals. So these are the five initial demands that I identified, which is most repeating across the surgeons in different departments. Then I convert it into uh, technical goals that into more technical language. For example, complex dental preparation means we should have something ready to use, preparation for effect catechisms. Slow tissue sealing means we need to have something fast, like you know, wet tissue incompatible, active bleeding incompatible. It just means we need a wet tissue, wet tissue mechanisms and blood resistant tissue mechanisms and formulation. So these are first conversion. And then with this technological goal, I can do something as a focus of development, but sadly or good or bad, I just had a gut feeling that, well, achieving all of them at once might be unrealistic. So what I did is I grouped and prioritized developmental goals based on current capability that I already can do, which means I have to build upon it, but I don't need to do newly. And what's the importance and the relative difficulties of unsatisfied goals? So in my case, I group into the two priorities, the wet addition, fast addition, and easy to use, ready to use these things of group one. And the second group is blood resistant because I thought this harder, and it turns out it's actually harder. And I have a current capability, robust, stable to ceiling because it's basically come from my earlier research. So I don't need to redo it, but I have to build upon it. So the key point here I learned is that, say I developed something for priority one group. I developed something priority two group. It should not be separate. For example, if I do for a priority one group, wet addition and fast addition, that means it should be wet and it should be fast on wet addition, but also robust because I build upon my current capability. And I develop something for priority two is blood resistant. It means it's not only blood resistant, but it should be robust, fast, and the blood resistant. It is more like adding additional capability on top of each other by sharing a base technology or base understanding, not fragmented, but more like a focused and synergistic. So these are the kind of the theme that I had in mind in my development processes in the laboratory level. Then I actually made technologies. So first priority group one, I made a, a, some fast addition is now capable. I developed some interesting mechanisms. And for second one, I may develop another mechanisms. I may not go deep into the technological aspect of it, but I just published it. And more importantly, I filed a patent for each. And again, these are really building upon, for example, this fast addition is not only fast, but fast and robust. And this uh, following resistant weather addition is not only following resistant, but is robust, fast, and the following resistance. So this kind of building up process. So this was a very uh, 
uh, intellectually organized the way I feel I did it. And the third is building upon. And the fourth is now I have base technology that is more conceptual design principles and the base raw materials that I need to implement these base technologies into semi product device. I call it a semi product because it's not yet a fully developed product for indication specific preclinical study, mostly on animals. But most importantly, doing this in close collaboration with end users. In my case, it's clinicians. Clinicians, I can talk and ask them to use an animal for large animals, small animals. Small animals, typically, I do myself a lot of peaks. The clinicians should do that themselves. So I currently have a two type of things, but it's kind of keep increasing. Uh, but the important thing is that they does share the base material and mechanism. So they are not a separate entity. It's really a something that I can feed into uh, one thing. And the last step I did is, which is very interesting is, when we make a semi product by implementation and ask our collaborator, end user collaborator to use it on preclinical models they developed. And then they suddenly have more feedback to us because they are now first time used it in a real, realistic situation. And then these feedbacks are sometimes positive and negative and it actually comes together with the overlooked AMET demand, which is missing in the initial, the initial identification of AMET demand from the customer. And then once we find this, uh, like a newly discovered demands are critical to achieve, then we just need to repeat the one and four steps again, to building on the other technologies to further upgrading the expanding the portfolio. So in my case, we discover the three overlooked demand once we give to the, our collaborator and let them use the chips. So they said, oh, fast and robust addition is wonderful, but it also comes together with the concern that how, we, how they can remove when they want to remove for some mistake, et cetera. So then we need a traumatic and demand detection capability. And surgeons say, oh, it works great on open surgery, but increasing portion of the surgeries become minimally invasive in robotic surgeries. I think it's better to be compatible with this growing sector of surgery. A great point, we need to do it. And another wound healing experts are to say, oh, this is great sealant, this is great dressing, but sometimes we want to also close the wound and facilitate the wound healing, et cetera, so mechanical modulation of a pro like a more uh, programmable or desirable manner. But that's a great thing because healing is critical. So these are a new met demands and we thought, discussed with them, and think this is important thing to have into our technological capability that we develop new technologies and adding all those things and um, publish things and file the patent as the typical processes. So it's kind of keep growing. And as a result, um, these are five steps, uh, but it can be different from different fields, but I just wanted to share because it was very intellectually fulfilling process to give it into this kind of perspective, in my opinion. And as a result, now we have a uh, keep growing technological portfolios with a highly focused synergistic capability based on shared materials and mechanisms. And now we kind of Got dump this poor thing into our uh, startup teams. Uh, we currently with uh, myself as co-founders and my case advisor and uh, Dr. Nastik as a medical co-founder. And we currently having more team members on a business operation side of it. We just dump poor portfolio into our startup teams. And now we have a pretty flexibility. Uh, functionality wise, form factor wise, we can choose desired functionalities into a favorable form factor based on indicated specific requirement. Although we need a focus for startup, but these are the something that make us be more flexible and uh, more powerful in terms of pipeline technology. So these are the something that I try differently from other uh, earlier uh, more paper oriented uh, development processes. And uh, I think that this is sometimes largely missing in academic uh, domain of a technology development, especially people who uh, deal with the new materials and new technologies. So, there, I, like in my personal experience with this process, I believe there is way to be balance the academic novelty and the innovation and the focus and synergistic development of technology so that avoiding the fragmentization as much as possible so that like building strong portfolio of ourselves, but also help other people to see in more consistent manner across the developmental cycles. So that was just basically a personal experiences so, and after which, in the later part, I want to talk more about all these stage considerations when I decided that, wow, well, this is the something that we have a strong portfolio. We want to dump four things into our startup team and going for the commercialization processes. And it comes together with a lot of learning from mentors 
And I want to share some of the things that I usually learn for, as a researcher's perspective, which are pretty ignorant about both perspectives. The first thing is IP. You may notice that I put a, a issued IPs and a pending uh, application numbers all together with the literature because paper is way to protect our academic outcomes. But the patents are the way to protect intellectual property. So these are really US systems with USPTO, so different country may be different, but it's more like a similar each other because USPTO is really standard uh, on many cases. So patent starts with a provisional patent. So provisional patent is where your priority date is generated. So basically the date you file your provisional patent determines your priority. So anything that filed after this priority date of your provisional patent cannot be patented because this is the date that protects you. And it's not evaluated by the examiner at USPTO, so you can submit anything. It's a, nobody evaluated, nobody look at this, just the, you just the submit it to keep your priority. And it's very low cost, it's cheap. And it's published publicly after one year, so you should not submit provisional if you don't want it to be publicly or not, like a release after one year. So once the provisional patent is being submitted, and after 12 months or one year in US system, it have to it have to convert it into non provisional patent, which is actual patent application. This one is evaluated by examiner at USPTO. So therefore, they evaluate the patent ability of the application. So depending on that, they may reject it, they may ask amendment, or they accept it. It's a complicated process, and therefore, it's expensive. It typically requires very experienced patent attorney to take care of this process. And when the moment of the non-provisional patent is filed, we can also file the PCT applications to confirm the priority date internationally. And then once the PCT is being filed, or, or, or depending on the countries, in within a one to 1.5 years, we have a chance to enter into national phases for each country to protect the patent in that country. And patent is finally issued that is not anymore pending patent, but is an issued patent means this is the start of the legal protection start. But the issue is it can take years. Like I, I, I one of my patent takes five years to get issued. And it takes sometimes eight years, 10 years. It's super tedious fight with the examiners that just continuously reject everything what you say. So it can be very, very, very lengthy processes. And, in, and once you issue, it's not end of the story. You need to pay the maintenance cost per claim every year. If you don't, your patent lost your legal protection power until you pay it again. So it requires maintenance cost, and each nation have separate processes. So meaning that you have a US issue patent doesn't mean you have protection in other countries. You need to do this again separately in different countries. So it is a strategic decision that what countries you're gonna get protection. Typically, EU and the US is the biggest option because uh, it's a big, uh, big Western market, but it depends. Few things about patent. Uh, it's really not very carefully thought for researchers who are very prone to talk everything to everybody, but provisional application should be filed before any public disclosure to keep patent ability. And the public disclosure is any form of online publication, including preprints. And often it includes the publicly accessible presentations to something like this. And if examiner find this later, you lose your patent ability. This is very critical because it's very much often overlooked by researchers who are very free to present everything in conferences and publish everything. And second, academic institutions typically support only domestic patents. For example, US institutions, US patents. And uh, here in US, most federally funded works are supported for domestic US non-provisional filing by institution because it's required as part of sponsored research agreement. And third, if invented part of employment, it's not yours, it's your, uh, your institutions. So the ownership issue is out there. So, and regarding the patents, one another thing that the researchers, you know, like the naive yet good-minded researchers are overlooking is collaboration can make a big, big headache on IP issues. Because technology, technology developed by interinstitutional collaboration can result in joint IP, meaning that ownership is spreading across different institutions, but it requires special attention. Because um, 
The first thing is not yours. Uh, when you do the IT generation during employment by certain institution and meeting certain conditions, most of the time conditions are if anything being done by sponsored research funding, most of the fun funding administered by the institution, either from federal agencies or company, and or using university facilities and resources to do invention, are belongs to that institution or ownership. It's not yours. You are inventor, but ownership are transferred to that institution. And second is IP ownership can be split differently across different institutions, but licensing right typically should belongs to one institution and this requires sometimes ended up in a very complicated negotiation so it requires some attention even before uh, starting or even talking with the technology licensing offices before forming a collaboration can be a good time and sometimes negotiation between institution takes time and typically they do they cannot file before negotiations are closing status so you may lose your priority date because of this uh, nasty negotiation. So early engagement to each technology licensing offices if you're doing collaboration is wisdom. Early engagement is wisdom. Don't contact them once you have right now everything, but just engage them as early as possible, especially for joint IT issues. And fourth is very important. It's better not, or it's be very careful to promising any inventorship to collaborator too early because you have your idea, but once you have ready to do something and your institution's technological licensing office who should be in charge of these uh, filing things, may disagree with your opinion like, oh no, we don't wanna keep up inventorship to that institution because we should 100%. Then you will find in very awkward positions like you basically lie. So it's be very necessary to be careful about promising any inventorship to collaborate to all this. It's better actually not to make any promises about inventorship in joint IT situation. So these are the few things you really better to know because sometimes we learn this in very hard way. And uh, there are several distinctions uh, between paper and pot, which is unfamiliar when for researchers. Um, papers targeting academic papers, peers, a product is for users is key value for paper is novelty while product is marketability just the down to the earth marketability and evaluations by editors and reviewers and product is by inventors and users, investors and users and gore's academic impact of the product is financial impact and the success criteria maybe paper is uh, publishing nature science maybe uh, but a uh, product is obviously is a high revenue and the profit is financial impact it's very different so it's kind of similar and different and as a researcher, I find that these are a good tips or good things to know before learning in hardware. Uh, academic novelty, especially for biotechnologies, can be a double-edged sword because more new or untried components can be interesting, but at the same time, it can lead to higher regulatory burden because you have your liability of proving it is safe or working. And second, uh, this is a uh, uh, well. This is very uh, interesting. Nature science paper doesn't guarantee per successful product or getting investment at all. Not at all. Like you have a three nature paper, two science paper, forget about it. It's just different story. It just uh, works differently just because the paper and the product have a different uh, late, like ways of evaluating or different ways of interacting or targeting people's and outcomes and success criteria. So it can be encouraging start, but it does not guarantee anything a smooth path onward. And third, which I learned personally the hard way, start a made focus. So it's a great thing. It's always increasing devaluation and investors' happiness by having extensive capability, but start a made a focus. So mostly because of the lack of the resources, it requires one product and indication based on market potential. So you know it, it's kind of different. So having a great set of technological portfolio is a great thing, but in terms of initial focuses, you just need a typically one or two. So uh, these are the biomedical device commercial lighting overview, which I take from this great uh, review. Uh, this really summarized well in US system and some of the uh, EU system. So you can take a look at this paper probably, uh, although there are more information you can find more specifically. So these are uh, several steps of uh, development and especially regulatory processes. 
So I may not uh, discuss all of this because these are relatively well defined the summaries that you can read other literatures. And in my case, uh, we are class three high risk, and uh, we are in uh, like a technical transfer transfer and uh, the product definition side. And once this being done, we need to go for clinical trials. So these are the great paper you can read about it. It's focused on tissue these things, but it's generally work on most of the biotech devices. Uh, for a little more uh, specific information of this a broader overview of thing, uh, there are several considerations that an inventor in university should take care in laboratory level development. One is material choice. Being too creative on material choice can be a substantial regulatory manufacturing, but don't do it. It's better to use as much material with FD or proof history or established GMP supplier existing out there and adding a little bit of secret ingredient as minimal as possible. That's make your stuff distinguishable, but just don't make everything, everything uh, like too creative. It's a big burden. And uh, for that, FDA.gov is one of the most unfriendly website I ever seen in my life, but it's one of the best resources to search. <laughs> it's a really great website. And uh, second is even during doing uh, experiment for research purposes for a paper publication, it's a wisdom to uh, try to adopt standards, even in abbreviated form. For example, uh, you can do whatever ad hoc uh, research protocol or uh, bench characterization method. You can tinker in yourself or imagine yourself. Don't do it because there are standards, there are really a lot of standards for many, many different types of characterization. For example, mechanical tests, you can take a look at the ACE, ASTM standard, and they basically have standards almost all possibly imaginable mechanical tests. And for biosafety, there are very extensive ISO 10993, which is a FDA also take this. There are standards for biosafety in vitro, in vivo, and all this kind of toxicology kind of things are standard out there. It's very expensive and very, high burden to do it exactly like that is typically done by an outsourced company, but we still can read and learn and try to adopt it into a abbreviated form or at least a little simplified form, even within our laboratory level characterization and bench top and frequent study. And this is a great wisdom because it saves a lot of things where we need to do this seriously. And the third is documentation. Uh, grad students and uh, like uh, job searching post are typically in a hurry mind is very much messing up things, but it's not good. Even in lab experiments, good documentation of protocol, testing method, testing outcomes is a great blessing in tech transfer stage because just the, just sorting out like a several years of a research outcome that is never documented properly is itself is a great burden and sometimes it's like a prohibitively discouraging to do it. So because this tech transfer is the first step for most of the lab grown tech startups, it's really important to take care of the documentation nicely, even in the technology development stage in the laboratories. So there are pathways and these are more complicated thing, but I just wanna share is in a good information. Uh, EU need a CMR, it's different from US FDA. But the, here is some bad news for people like us that are entering into more recent because it was previously approved based on safety criteria, but the revised rule now become more similar to FDA system. So it's not that easier. And uh, for FDA, there are basically two cases. Low risk devices are going for 510k pre-market notification. And good thing about this thing is not required, typically not required clinical trial but it requires substantially equivalent product, which means your thing is not new. You, there, there is equivalent products already out there, but you just have very, very minor modification made on it. And therefore they agree that it kind of be safe. I don't expect any surprise in terms of safety. So they don't require, most typically don't require clinical trial. So it's low cost, but also it's very unlikely that you're gonna have a very unique market position because everybody can do it cheaply and fast because it does not require clinical trial and is already existing substantially equivalent product out there. Most of the advanced and venturous medical devices should go for PMA, pre-market approval, which is high risk. And because it is a high risk, uh, it requires clinical trials, people like the pilot and people for clinical trials. And because it requires a human clinical trial before being approved for human use, it requires to obtain investigational device exemption, IDE, before clinical trial, which itself costs a lot of money. 
So clinicaltrial.gov is also again great resource. Again, like the second worst website I've ever seen, uh, but it's still very, very, very great resource to learn what people need to do clinical trials before get approved. And uh, it's very high risk. Typically, um, tens of million dollars is, is necessary. And there are some more recent things like the breakthrough device programs, but this is really about a breakthrough. And hopefully we, what we do can be a breakthrough, but this criteria is pretty uh, unpredictable in regards to discussion with the FDA. So, but it's good to know that there are uh, 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 options to expedite uh, the process, these lengthy processes, if your particular technology fits the criteria. So uh, there are various other resources you fall through quickly, as I mentioned. I call this great. You can really try. Customer discovery is a great thing. Uh, SBIR uh, is something, the early stage funding, you can go for it. But I and our team didn't go for it because there are several conditions. Uh, first, you need to be incorporated. Second, the PI don't need to be your professor or your, yourself to become a faculty. Anybody who with a scientific expertise can be a PI or SBIR grant. Requires employment by the startup incorporated at least 51%. So it means your majority of employment should come from startup. Means that you cannot anymore a majorly hired by any academic institutions to get the SBIR. So our case, our team's case is a little complicated. We didn't go for it, but this can still be a great resources, but it can give a pretty sizable funding in early period. Uh, and the, you should talk with the TLO because the technology licensing office is the forks that you need to talk to license the technology you invented, but owned by your institution to get license to your startup complicated processes. So it's better to talk earlier. And there are a lot of awards and competitions. I try some myself giving a tiny amount of loan dialogue to catch the word. But the, pre the precaution here is time is money. So sometimes it, it takes too much time to get there. Maybe the award would be lower than what your time invested in to get those are being actually, uh, you know, monetarily means. So it really requires portions. So uh, it's a little kind of random talks, but I want to have a closing remark. This is still early stage, but I think it's kind of more resonating with the researchers in the laboratory who are willing to push out of the laboratory. But I think that there is a one share one thing that I want to share as a researcher or engineer that I passed through. The biggest satisfaction is about when we find our researchers become purposeful, especially in alignment of personal life and value. So I believe, uh, at least for me, it is a guiding principle for research, innovation, and translation, not a writing another paper, which has nature or science, but this is more like a guiding principle for research, innovation, translation. And as a closing remark, uh, I don't know whether you guys know, but maybe some people know that I recently changed my like expanded my interest to the bioelectronics. And many people ask me, why you suddenly start to do bioelectronics? And, uh, and this is, I think, is a great example I want to share as a closing remark, because it now become really a guiding principle for my research. Because uh, my mother got diagnosed with the Parkinson's disease around two years ago. And my brother still have a paralyzed right foot. So given this personal suffering combined again, Bioelectronic devices for neurological treatment become my second resonating topic in my life. So I did a study and discussed with experts, and I find hydrogen technologies can be a promising contribution. I write a review, I did a bunch of research, and I, you could see that I actually published quite a lot in recent two years, just because I now find this is a resonating topic yes, to me. So the question is, can I contribute to solve this threat? I don't know. I don't know yet, but uh, just I, as an engineer, as a researcher, I just feel very purposeful to in doing it this way. Instead of, I just willing to have one more nature science paper, but I just do it because it's resonating with my personal problems. And I think I can do something better to solve it. So it's really resonating and it's really purposeful in my mind. And I believe this can be a great guiding principles for myself and probably other researchers, because I, I think, uh, being purposeful in, as an engineer in connection with the society uh, is really important part of being a researcher in, um, in the world. So this is my closing remark. And with that, I want to acknowledge uh, the MIT's and uh, you know, Professor Connor Jaws group peoples that I have worked, worked together and also clinical collaborators across the US, 
and uh, several translations I call from MIT Dish Finance Center, Venture Management Services, and all the app work that um, I'm doing with the startup team that I have currently. And for that, I would like to thank you for all for your attention. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Yunghu, for your for sharing how how you embark on the the tech transfer journey. Fascinating, I find it, especially as I am entrepreneur myself, so I can really relate on multiple aspects you have spoken uh, previously, especially on you know conducting market research, talking to people who really you know want your your product, and also providing samples and then conduct product iterations. Uh, yeah, definitely, it is. Uh, uh, it, it's almost reassuring to, to to me to see that it's like uh, it's it's pretty similar to what I've done before as well. Yeah, uh, thank, thank you very you. much. <laughs> um, so I think now it's the time for the Q and A sessions. It uh, we will open the uh, the floor to the our audience as well. We um, so if anyone have any comments and questions to to Dr. Yu, uh, you're very welcome to raise your hand and ask your questions. So me and Biha will be co-hosting this to facilitate the conversation. Yeah, and we would encourage you to turn on your camera if you <laughs> prefer, so that it's more interactive. Yeah. Um, do we already have someone promoted to the panel? Um, can you raise your hand if you were promoted yeah, to the panel? Yeah. Cool. Um, Xiao Xiao, would you like to? Hey. Yeah, thank you. Um, um, thank you, uh, uh, Dr. Yuk, uh, for your very fascinating um, uh, presentation. And uh, I think it's very informative. And uh, um, I, I just, yeah, I, I just have uh, uh, two questions, basically. Um, so to start with, uh, how, how do you define a boundary of your research work that um, is um, enough workload, let's say, to uh, apply for a patent? Um, I mean, there there are a lot of uh, components or um, aspects in uh, research work, and how do you define? Oh, let's see, um, um, this particular technology is good enough for a patent, or it, the workload is just enough for applying for a patent. That's my uh, first uh, question. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Let me answer that quickly first. Um, that's a great question because. Uh, I will say most of the researchers in university don't have time to separately pursue research uh, in the form of the academic paper and the patent application separately. And I do personally didn't have such a chance as well. So how it goes is uh, we first focusing on a level of uh, things that we think uh, good enough to circulate in the academic field academic field in the form of the paper. And we make, uh, we convert our early stage manuscript into so-called technology, te technology disclosure, which each institution have their own version of technology disclosure form, which is nothing but uh, just a little more like um, expanded version of your manuscript. And then we submit to our technology uh, licensing office. Each institution have a TLO or a licensing office. And then let them review it. And then we most of the time, they actually can give a very uh, early stage comment that they think this is a great technology, would be patentable, and they are willing to pursue the patent. And they actually sometimes frankly tell you that this is interesting research, but we may not want to pursue the patent filing with this technology because of this, this, this reason, such as they think it is not patentable. Second, they don't have a protection power because you cannot detect the infringement based on context matter. Or third, this is not a patentable item in a USPTO or whatever, US, whatever patent system. So what we do is we do the research. We have the early stage manuscript or whatever we can share to it. We convert that into a simple tech disclosure form and submit to the tech licensing office early on and keep talking with the lawyer in there to get their feedback, how they think, whether this is patentable or not patentable, or are you willing to patent it or not? So depending on that answers, if the answer is positive, then okay, great. 
We write a paper, but make sure we file a patent by working with the assigned patent attorney. They pay upfront, which we need to pay back later. Uh, while we are working on the research research paper, so they make sure that at least the provisional application is submitted before our online publication of the paper. So early engagement with the lawyer working in your institution's licensing office is probably the best way you can get the sense of whether you can do it in parallel or you just don't think about a patent at all. Uh, okay, I see. Okay, thank you very much for the answer. It's, it's uh, very clear. So, um, in, so in a word, is uh, uh, just the researchers don't generally define um, like what what I uh, wanted to um, submit to the patent office. It's just the licensing office and the lawyers that uh, um, is yes. deciding yes, this. Yes, correct. Good. Yeah, it's a, it's. I think the mm -hmm. translation is really about uh, knowing that who are the professional expert on what. You know, extending, uh, okay. trying to do something that you do not understand is the easiest way to make things messy and fail. So patents okay. it falls within a legal world that are being handled by patent attorneys and we need them to help us to evaluate things properly. I see, okay, thank you very much. Um, yeah, and they, um, the, the second question is kind of, uh, um, um, so to speak, sensitive uh, uh, topic, but uh, um, I think uh, mo probably most of the people would uh, encode this. Um, it's just, uh, um, so let's say if you really put a lot of time and uh, your contribution to a project, and years later, um, you, you found out that uh, uh, the other two collaborators has already filed and granted a patent without you, without even uh, uh, telling you, um, so, so in this case, what, what, what could you do? What options do you have? And uh, how, 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 how will you uh, uh, well, uh, resolve this problem? First of all, that's a fortunate situation that oh, nobody wants to see that. Uh, mm -hmm. Second, uh, <laughs> it's always good to resolve the issues in goodwill manner. But if it requires a more official actions to do it, and here comes the point that I say documentation is a critical, is you should have documentation that you generated uh, in a mm -hmm. publicly you know, accessible and the guaranteeable manner that prove your intellectual contribution to that generation of intellectual property. And with that thing given, the technology licensing office in your institution can help you officially by arbitrating the issues to help you to get your deserved credit. But if you are being lazy in documentation of your contribution and technological development, so you don't have any documentation to support your um, you know, credit without, like only with your personal sentiment, there is no way to save you. Ah, uh, okay, I see. Um... Yeah, that's a very good point. But sometimes I, uh, I would say, um, I would foresee that uh, uh, there might be cases that uh, your contribution might be a kind of uh, blurry, um, meaning that uh, uh, um, you have your documentation there and uh, there are the people just to uh, say, um, um, we don't feel that uh, you, you're doing uh, enough contribution to you, like the novelties uh, it's not uh, from your part and stuff like that. Um, yeah, so that's a kind of more complicated situation. So, uh, well, it's, it's a human problem. So, uh, well, that's a, that's a, the, like, I talk with the many startup girls while I'm keep doing this. And I'm uh, like, if we, you ask anybody, maybe nine to 10 people say that, why you give up your startup? And it's because we didn't have a good team member. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so it, it's important to work with the people who can work well because that's the initiation of all the trouble most of the time. Like interestingly, I find that many technologies fail not because technology is inferior or problematic, but just that it is being tried to be pushed by wrong combination of people. Okay, yeah, sometimes uh, it's the people that's the problem, not the technology. <laughs> yeah, it's not a technology, it's a people is a problem. 
yeah. Okay. Cool. Um, thank you so much for 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 your answers and uh, uh, for your time. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, actually, can I can I add one related question before we call on the next speaker? So I was wondering from you know the commercialization perspective because after proof of concept stage where you can get a lot of support from the licensing office. In the next stage, you might need a lot of cost for clinical trials or commercialization. And that's where a lot of the big pharmas and med techs come in, you set up collaboration. So in that situation, what happens to the patent intellectual property and ownership when you know, your outcome eventually goes to a big pharma, big med tech and gets commercialized there? Yeah, so that's that's the great part. Uh, we as a team, we try to avoid a such a situation. But the key thing is that uh, whenever the major contribution, especially in terms of a financial support in the form of the investment, is coming into the team to do something, the matter of uh, intellectual property ownership as the outcome of that investment should be laid out clearly from the beginning. It cannot be it can, cannot be like implicitly being agreed in goodwill. It cannot be done in that way. So when we communicate with any parties that generating any IP related concerns, we need to write down the NDA, non disclosure agreement, MTA, material transfer agreement. We have to do this. And when you get investment from other people or in the form of the sponsor research or donation, whatever. Uh, you should have a person who can help you to figure out a contractual agreement that what everybody will expect in terms of ownership of the IP, joint ownership, etc. So I believe it is something that very case specific because some people may want to share their IP to, as a friendly gesture to do. Some people may not. So I think uh, it's just a very case specific. There is no border but it's just something that needs to be clearly discussed and written down in the documents with the help of the lawyers. <laughs> so, so if your device in a very short time um, is, you know, gets commercialized globally by, by another med tech company, does the university who supposedly owns the license get a share of the revenue? Uh, here's the thing. When you invent something while you keep a, uh, employment to the institutions and there are two sub conditions need to be satisfied. The first condition is whether that invention is being performed by sponsored research through university it means that the whatever funding either from company or federal agencies are go to university and the university will administer the funding for you. That means whatever thing you do get owned by the university. Or second condition, even though you didn't use any sponsored research funding from university, but you use the shared facility or resources that university provided, which is maintained by the overhead from researchers from that university, that it belongs to that institution. So to avoid the trouble, that's a kind of a, like a boundary or umbrella issues that everybody suffer. We also faced that issue recently that to avoid the ownership claim from the institution, you literally get out of university. You really need to do with your own facility that you pay everything and using your own fund. Or even using university, but there, the university share facilities actually have a two cost structure. One is price for internal members, cheaper. And the other is still can use it, but as an external member because local companies also use university facility. But you still can use the university facility, but you should pay that external user rate to avoid the ownership claim from the university. So it's it, it, it's not it's not really expecting to uh, like, oh, you were my previous uh, student, you were our previous faculty, whatever. So we are so happy to help you. No, 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 no. There is a clear boundary that they, they fire up their ownership claim and just need to avoid it. All right, thank you. Uh, Ponha, feel free to speak. Oh, thank you, Dr. Yip, for the uh, great talk. Uh, I have two questions. First one is uh, about the funds. Like you mentioned that the NIH uh, does offer like uh, uh, application of, uh, for the uh, startup and for small business. Like, did you ever get into the situation say you run out of the funds uh, and do you have to like uh, 
get into conversation with, say, like venture uh, venture capitals? Yeah, so that's a good question. So in our case, we are a little special cases because we are touching on biomedical technologies and we have a clinician as a founding member. So we could actually get a pretty uh, okay level of funding to support our large animal free clinical studies without having SBIR or venture capital. Like we could have, could have a, around 100K or something above monies to support it. But if someone doesn't have a, such a luxury, I think SBIR is a great option to go for it. But as I just write down quickly, SBIR requires several conditions that you need to consider. First of all, you need to incorporate. You know, it cannot be a, just a team. You should incorporate. Uh, second, uh, what like if you work with a, someone who are full faculty, like your advisor or your collaborator, they cannot be PI of that SBIR because SBIR requires at least the 51% employment to that startup being incorporated in the United States. Meaning that anybody who would have the full-time employment in academic institution cannot be a PI of the SBIR grant. So maybe you should be the PI of that SBIR grant. It means that you should be all, like a, employed by 51% at least. It means uh, you are not anymore majorly employed by any academic institution. So uh, it depends on the personal situation that is compatible or working options for people's career. In my case, I'm trying to do this, but I still majorly serve as an academic researcher. So I do not yet want to give up my academic affiliation to serve as an active academic researcher, meaning that I may not be possible to take the over 51% employment to a startup, meaning that two other co-founders are full-time faculty. So they are just basically prevented to become an SBIR PI. And I, have a little personal like option out there to become a 51% or 51% hired by the startup, meaning that all of the core co-founding members are ineligible to be a PI of SBIR. So we had to choose alternative option to get initial funding instead of choosing for SBIR. So there are conditions that SBIR or this kind of federal small grant for small businesses out there, but it depends on the person's certain the group members or team members choices and conditions about compatibility and eligibility. So these things are really, really well considered and meaning it has a risk, meaning you give up your academic uh, affiliation by being employed over 51% by startup. And startup may don't have money to pay you anything. So you are basically uh, like starting. Right. Right. <laughs> so it's, it's a choice, but- And, and that's actually part of yeah. Yeah, so it's, there are conditions. Uh, yeah, that's actually part of my. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, I let you finish first. No, no, yeah. I, I, I was saying like that's 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 my uh, second part of the question. Like since you are still active researcher, like so, how much uh, right now? Like, how much do you involved in the uh, running of the starting up? And also like uh, how do you balance like between your like uh, the the frontier original research and the, the translation? Well, that's a good question. So in my case, currently, I do not make any new research project because I do not. I just uh, try to wrap up what I did and 80%, 90% of them are the technologists that we're gonna keep licensing to our startup team. So it's more like just the keeping in my uh, researcher status to take the full advantage of uh, research resources that I can join in MIT. Um, but more or less, I just more or less uh, kind of keep doing it. So I, 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 my time to doing kind of duality is kind of counting. I actually have to stop doing this in the next six months or so. I have to be switched to full time, um, see something um, when we have a good CEO to work together to take care of operation. But I should say at the end of the day, people have to choose each option uh, for certain duration of the time because duality cannot go last. And, uh, that's why typically pure professor form startups are all fake. Most of them are fake because this duality is hard. If there is someone who get out of the research and just to take care of this thing. And in our case, because of this a clinical and medical device theme, we can still contain a lot of uh, early stage preclinical study we anyway need to do to form a strong pitch deck to get a larger size investment within still the scope of the academic research in collaboration with the clinical collaborators. But that's a luxury of this particular field. But uh, 
if this is not allowed, it's just the people sometimes being forced to get out of the university, give up the affiliation and just to work on full time right. without getting paid. <laughs> okay. All right. I think that's all my questions. Well, thank you. Thank you for her. Thank you. Uh, Hume for the re reply as well. Uh, we still have two more questions lined up on, on the Q&A list. So the next person can, uh, Kave, you can unmute yourself and uh, perhaps uh, you know, show your show your video as well if you if you want and, and ask your question. I think Kave said all his questions have just been answered. So maybe oh, right. we can go to Schema. <laughs> Schema right, sorry, yeah. Yeah, well, we are in still very early stage, but uh, we'll see. <laughs> well, my question is on a different range with other previous question. Um, so first, thank you, Dr. Yuk, for such a nice presentation. I learned a lot from you. I was taking notes, by the way. Um, so my question is about writing. Say now you're a professor and you have some young PhD student. What would you like to tell them about writing or about how to write a journal article or how to submit to a journal um, experience on this aspect. Yeah, that's a, that's a great thing. I always suffer even training our junior grad students in this group and I will suffer more if I right. don't know, I won't lie. Uh, well, there is, I don't think there is a golden rule, uh, but just the first of all, there is a barrier for international students who are writing something not in our native language, which was my case as well. Yeah. So this is just a hard time to overcome. So it's uh, first of all for that familiarity issues, just need to read a lot. <laughs> so like a read a lot from good writing. And uh, mm -hmm. uh, I, I, I am not a big fan of a, a publication franchise such as Nature Publishing Group or Wiley Publishing Group. I am not a big fan of it. But I should say, especially Nature Publishing Group, they do have a very high quality editorial copy editing processes. So their papers, especially their uh, major journal papers are heavily copy edited to make sure the writings are clean and uh, concise enough. So reading those papers a lot is actually helping to get used to a relatively higher standard of scientific writing. It was my case, that was very helpful. And second thing that I, my personal uh, learning while uh, helping uh, more junior grad students are writing things is um, writing only necessary sentences is a really difficult, but the best type of writing. Like the best paper, in my opinion, my personal opinion, in best writing papers, even grants, you cannot even remove a one sentence because every sentence in that writing paper or grant is necessary. So if you remove one sentence, you suddenly break the logic. So if one can still remove a lot of sentences, that means the writing is probably not still in the well purified form. So I think the practice to remove the redundant part of the writing to make it into so concisely essential in nature in core part is really helpful practice, at least in, in, for me to do. Yeah, I totally agree with the second part because uh, there is a quote to uh, support your uh, second part is the perfect writing is when you have nothing to remove. So it's basically exactly what, what you say, but you talk about it in more details. So thank you very much. Yeah, I, I agree. I totally agree. Like say, if I asked to write something for my grad, junior grad and trainee, like he may write a lot and I, look, I can remove two thirds of it. <laughs> yeah, I agree with that. Yeah. So thank you for your advice. I think it's really helpful. I'll tell my senior PhD student to follow your advice. Yeah, it's hard. I, I think it's hard because uh, especially smart people in universities have an implicit tendency to show off what they know. Like, I know this detail, I know this, I know this, you know, yeah, I, I know everything this. Ever. Yeah, I know this, this, this. But actually many of them are just the need to go for methods section. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Thank you for your answer. That's very interesting. Thank you. All right. Uh, can, I, can I ask a question kind of related to the previous question? Uh, yeah. So uh, uh, so first, thank Dr. Yi for the wonderful talk. Um, you have had a really successful PhD. So I was wondering if you can share uh, your experience on how to be so productive during grad school. How do you like distribute your time between doing experiments and uh, analyzing your data and writing all the manuscript and even the patents? Well, that's a great question. Uh, first of all, I, I'll be very frank. I'm not married. Uh, I don't have kids. And therefore, <laughs> therefore, I can invest most of my time for doing work. And that's basically the prerequisite condition to work a lot. And I never think this is the recommendable mode uh, for anybody. But just a matter of fact, I don't have a family to care. So that's the precondition, first condition. Uh, so if someone have a person to care in personal life, they should work less. So the productivity as a researcher or a worker of any kind and the personal satisfaction in life is, I think is not a something put together. For example, as I just try to deliver as much as possible. To me, because I don't have family to support yet, hopefully I have in the future, but I kind of personally feel very engaged when I try to work on things that I believe is interesting and resonating with me. So I just work hard and that's a kind of, I'm being a little workaholics. Uh, and the second part uh, to answer your question, uh, the productivity is, uh, is not a single person's effort. It's not, but for example, in my case, I write a, I, I write a quite a bit, uh, but I don't think it can be possible if I work alone. It's just the inhumane uh, level. Uh, so I believe the collaboration is really critical. Uh, but what, what I want to personally emphasize is that the uh, collaboration in real, real manner, like say um, many collaboration, well, I also had some of such bad things, but very commonly, Collaboration is supposed to be synergistic. So saving each other's time to do something while keeping productivity high. But at the end of the day, many collaborations are destructive. So are spending more time of each time and with lower productivity than individual sum of capability. So in my opinion, I really try hard myself to make this be synergistic. And one thing that I really care always is uh, try not to take more than your collaborator. Let them take as much as possible from the collaboration and just uh, emphasizing on the fact that we are collaborating to make this thing more efficient instead of taking it as advantage to utilizing other people's time and expertise to adding one more paper to your CV. So sometimes I give more credit to my collaborator than they actually did. And I'm totally fine with it. And uh, I think I just keep doing it more and more. I think I can become more productive because I do also have my own reputation building up around when I work with people because you know I can be a great collaborator to work together because I'm friendly, I can be friendly. I can care more of them instead of taking more from them to get more and more paper from my uh, CV. So it's a, it's a losing game in initial period, say, it's effectively a losing game in first year, say. But I think by repeating this again and again, I think eventually become a great winning game. So say like two thirds of the academic work that I did is from collaboration. Uh, and uh, the fact that I could keep a nice collaborative relationship with the sincerity and a mutual respect and uh, uh, those things, uh, and I actually collaborating not once, but many times with the one collaborator, unless I don't, I am not happy with a certain person. So I think it really helped me to do a lot of things uh, in parallel while not burn out. So I think that's a very important thing. So basically the putting more emphasis on philosophy of, I just enjoy do what I care. I, I don't care much on paper, but I still care to write a paper because a good figure, fancy papers and public release is all good. 
but just the, that's a byproduct of our enjoyable collaboration, not a main goal. And you can be more generous about a credit. Like, okay, you take a first first authorship, it doesn't matter, kind of thing. Then it's really make people happy to work together and it's excited to work together and we can be really productive. But say people dispute each other like, well, I think I should be the first to first author because I do more like, you know, I don't think so then, like, then they suddenly become uh, the worst enemy next day and uh, your collaboration just go nowhere. And if you do three times and uh, you develop faction in your research group and between the research field or school of thought and just productivity just not there. So I think in general is really good because at the end of the day, say like when we, like we are young researchers, but when we see a senior researchers that preceded us, people write hundreds of papers in life, right? Having one or two more first to first of the paper doesn't make any change or any difference in our life when we eventually write 500 papers. Yeah, uh, but at the beginning of our PhD, sometimes like people like in some group, people take turns to be the first co-first author. Like sometimes you are the first one. Next time, like uh, like the other one will be the first one. Like, but as we become more senior, probably we care less about the like order of the authorship, and uh, we care more about the collaboration and uh, doing what we want. So probably like then we can be like more generous. <laughs> like, yeah, so that, 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 yeah. For that, I totally agree because that's very important for our career development, but this is my personal thing. Uh, instead of uh, being a little picky on those uh, like the caustic discussion, they say, let's be very happy. Let's be extremely productive. So how about instead of writing one paper, let's write a three paper. Then you take one, I take two, or we take one and one and give one other for a few people out there. So just that, that, that's my philosophy that I really enjoy. Like instead of being, you know, like a big tension building, when, when tension is building up, people are really reluctant to work more because they are keep calculating in their head, gee, like if I do this, can I take more, blah, blah, blah. That, just forget about it. I will be generous at this time for you and you will be generous ne next time for me. But just to keep this momentum and make everything perfectly efficient, make more work. So therefore we just increase the pie instead of the, dragging the feet by thinking about calculating like, okay, like is this really the best the benefit of my time, et cetera. So, and, and I thought it was crazy, but at the end of the day, now I finished my PhD and I thought it was a good strategy. Like maybe I, if I take a feet dragging a strategy to calculating and this is the best interest of mine, blah, blah, blah. I may just publish half papers than what I have. But instead, like, okay, you take it. Like, I take it next time if you have more, but I, I don't know whether it's gonna happen or not, but I just do it. And and uh, I believe when smart people are motivated together to work together very happily, the level of a synergy can be, I think the double, triple, quadruple is really high. So it's literally possible to write multiple, many more work. <laughs> Yes, yes, it's not a one-time deal. Yes, thanks for sharing your experience. It's very helpful. Thanks, Jonathan, for your question as well. Um, question, just cautious on time, we'll take one last question from uh, Hassin. Uh, you can unmute yourself and ask your question. Thank you very much, Dr. Yu. Very fascinating talk, really enjoyed it. My question is, uh, <clears throat> how do you usually organize your research? Like. Uh, from the beginning of uh, idea development uh, to to building up your team and then uh, doing the experiments. How do you assemble your figure sets uh, and advices like that? That would be great if you could share it with us. Uh, sorry, can you repeat the last part again? Sure. I mean, assembling the figure sets, how do you decide which figure goes well? And how do, for, for instance, uh, make your own schematics and, and presentations in, 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 a, in a research paper? That's my question. Uh, yeah, that's a, well, I think each person have a different way, but in my case, um, I love empty boxes with the word because <laughs> uh, it, it's for complicated illustration and plots for research work. 
it's a pain to draw everything and rearrange and reorganize. Size changes, font size changes, and everything changes. So what I really love is uh, just empty squares, empty rectangles. So just try to arrange in a layout first, and then uh, filling in with the right layout. And and uh, uh, well, I don't want to advertise a certain publishers, but the, I think MPG Nature Publishing Group is really doing good at it because. When you take a look at the paper figure preparation guideline from their website, they actually give a pretty good high-level description of what they think is a good arrangement, what they think is good approaches. And they even have a very detailed guideline of width of the full page figures, half page figures, two-third column figures kind of thing. So it's, I think, very helpful to see those kind of a really well-established industry established publication guideline. And for them, in my cases, um, I already, like, I pre decide whether I want this figure to be full page with it, half page with it, or two third page with it, like two columns. And I make the artboard and illustrator into exactly that size. But for example, 183 millimeter for full page with it for nature, or nature review series is 108 millimeter with it, something like that. And then I draw all the squares with the like ABCD sub panel uh, labels and write out something that what I think it can be there. Then I choose my color sets, like the five to six color sets that I'm gonna use throughout the whole figure. So I have the color board, I have the figure panel, I have the layout, then I just play with the thing and just use some imagination how it looks like and then draw it and show the other people. This is beauty, you need to show other people. Like if you take a look at your own drawing, it always looks beautiful. But the problem is when you show this to other people, like your colleagues or whatever, they just say like, I don't understand what you're drawing. So then it's something wrong and going back. So I, I think it's just, uh, I, I think that that's a really helpful processes to uh, lay outing, drawing and get a critique from colleagues the who you can show it before the publication. And then it's really testing the understanding of other people that if nobody can follow your figure, although you think it's beautiful, I think it's not. Good. <laughs> thank you. Thank yes. you, Hussein, for your question. By the way, uh, one of our first talks was by Jen, who introduced some of his experience making figures. Yeah. So if you're interested, um, pin him. He'll share the link to the YouTube recording. Sounds so very good. Yeah, so that was amazing talk. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Yuk. I hope you enjoy the questions from the audience as well. Um, I've personally learned a lot from this session as well from like a consultant perspective. So thank you so much. Um, thank you so much. And thank yeah. you everyone. Have a nice weekend. Yeah, thank you. Bye-bye. Yeah, Bye-bye. <laughs>